Hello, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in for our September Research Spotlight webinar. I'm Dr. Sarah Hernandez, the Director of Research Programs at the Hereditary Disease Foundation. I want to start by thanking our sponsors for this webinar, Neurocrine Biosciences and Unicure, and also thank you to everyone who has donated to the HDF to support the research that we fund. Also, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Today's webinar is exciting because we're going to learn more about the protein that causes Huntington's disease. It's called the Huntington protein. And people often say that we don't know what the Huntington protein does, but in truth, we know a lot about what it does. We just don't know everything that it does. And that's because the Huntington protein has lots and lots of different functions inside the cell. So having a better understanding of exactly what the Huntington protein does and how it functions could help uncover pathways for therapeutic intervention. We are joined today by two stellar scientists who study exactly that, the function of the Huntington protein. We're joined by Dr. Judith Friedman and Dr. Natalia Barbosa, both from Stanford University. Dr. Friedman grew up in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She received her PhD in biochemistry from the University of Buenos Aires. She carried out her postdoctoral training at the Sloan Kettering Institute in New York. Dr. Friedman's research focuses on understanding how proteins fold inside a cell. Her lab uses a multidisciplinary approach to address fundamental questions about proteins that aid in folding, protein folding, and degradation. In addition to basic mechanistic principles, she and her team aim to define how impairment of protein folding and quality control are linked to disease, including both cancer as well as neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's. She examines whether re-engineering protein folding networks could provide therapeutic strategies. She also serves as a member of HGF's Scientific Advisory Board. Dr. Natalia Barbosa is a postdoctoral scholar in Dr. Friedman's lab at Stanford. She was awarded HDF's Nancy S. Wexler Young Investigator Prize in 2022. This is a prize that is given each year to a researcher whose work reflects the highest caliber of excellence, diligence, and creative thinking. Her research focuses on uncovering the intricate relationship between the creation of proteins how they're processed inside the cell and the effects those processes have on the cell's powerhouse, the mitochondria. Dr. Barbosa is testing if and how mitochondria participate in the formation of protein clumps within a cell that are a defining feature of Huntington's disease. Understanding the connection between mitochondria and protein clumping may change the way we think about Huntington's disease, potentially opening up new strategies for effective therapeutic intervention. Thank you both so much for joining us to share your work today. Before we start, I want to remind our audience that questions can be asked in the Q&A box throughout the talk. Make sure it's the Q&A box, not the chat box. We will have uh, both HD families on the call as well as researchers, so feel free to ask both technical and non-technical questions. We should have about 20 minutes at the end for Q&A with our speakers, so type your questions in as you think of them so that you don't forget, and we will get to as many of those as we can. Again, thank you so much for everyone for being here, and I will pass it over to Judith. Okay, well, first, thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you about our work. I'm going to try to give you an overview of uh, the research we have been doing on Huntington's research in my lab for, I would say, well over a decade. So uh, I'll try to give you a sort of overview of uh, both the interest in my lab and what type of questions we've asked and uh, uh, how these could impact the development of therapeutic avenues. Okay, so my lab, as uh, Sarah mentioned, one of the main interests of our research is to try to understand how the cell manages its proteins. And when I became interested in the problem and, uh, as a chemist, I was interested in the complex chemical interactions that make a extended polypeptide, a protein, adopt the unique three-dimensional state that characterizes all functional proteins. And at that time, this was thought to happen spontaneously in the cell following the rules of thermodynamics and kinetics, which, of course, it does, but in the cell, this process is really very complicated. And uh, I like to think about it a little bit like the Japanese art of origami, where you also have instructions for a unique shape. But when you try to do this, you very often 
end up with uh, off pathway products, damaged products that don't resemble what the shape should look like. Now in the cell, this is particularly challenging because proteins need to fold in an incredibly complicated cellular milieu. So very often when proteins start to misfold, so meaning they fail to achieve their correct state, they uh, start to cause a lot of damage and you end up with a lot of misfolding that prevents the cells from functioning properly. Now, over the last maybe 15 years from work from many labs, it has become clear that Huntington is at its heart a disease of protein misfolding. So I don't think this audience needs uh, uh, this slide, but just to remind ourselves, Huntington, uh, the Huntington gene encodes for a very large protein. And in the beginning of this protein, there is a small tract of glutamines encoded by a CAG repeat. Now, when this tract of glutamines is under 35 glutamines long, you have a functional Huntington protein. When this tract becomes expanded and there are a number of genetic uh, 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 reasons why this tract can expand and then this can be inherited, the polyglutamine tract becomes longer. And there is a lot of evidence that this longer poly Q tract is responsible for pathogenesis. However, how this protein, which is not particularly abundant, causes so much damage, particularly to specific neurons in the brain, is not well defined. So in my lab, we have become very interested in understanding how the cell manages this mutant Huntington, which I will call M Huntington, for the remainder of my talk. And also we are interested in understanding why this protein with this mutation causes so much damage. So there are a number of hypotheses on uh, um, uh, why Huntington and the mutant Huntington causes damage. Some of them are that introducing this mutation in one of the two copies we, we have of the gene causes a loss of function. And we have learned that Huntington is an essential protein and it's really important for neuronal function. There could also be a gain of function. We know that misfolded proteins are incredibly toxic to cells, particularly to neurons. So this gain of function could become, uh, be part or a consequence of its abnormal conformation. There could be a mix of these. I'm happy to discuss this in <clears throat> the Q&A. And within this uh, hypothesis, one important question that I'll touch on is what is the role of Huntington aggregate? So one of the, let's say, pathological hallmarks of Huntington and actually many other neurodegenerative diseases is the appearance of fibrillar aggregates. And uh, it has been a very important question whether these aggregates are toxic or protective. And I'll have a lot more to say about that. Um, of course, understanding the reason for toxicity is fundamental to find a cure because to cure a problem we really helps a lot if we understand it. There have been a number of potential strategies uh, uh, to ameliorate uh, the, the root cause of Huntington. Perhaps one of the ones that had received the most attention in the last year is to reduce expression of the mutant protein using genetic interventions. These techniques, although they might still be successful, have the very, very significant pitfall that Huntington is a very important protein for neuronal function. So reducing its levels may not be a uh, viable uh, avenue for therapeutics. So maybe other alternatives that are now becoming more focused, and I will talk uh, more about uh, how we could target them, is if we can target the pathological, let's say, gain of function uh, uh, structures generated by this mutant hunting team, as well as target its consequences for the cell. And for that, we need to understand how hunting team is toxic. We know it is toxic. We know many processes fail when the, with mutant hunting team is expressed. So we need to understand how this works to be able to target them. So in my talk today, I'm going to tell you about three topics. 
The first one is I'll give you a brief introduction to what proteostasis is. So meaning how do cells manage misfolded, unfolded proteins? Second, I'll tell you what we have learned very briefly about how this machinery interfaces with Huntington and particularly with exon one, which seems to really be the agent of toxicity and then how we can harness this knowledge uh, to develop therapeutic approaches. So first, what is proteostasis? So like I mentioned uh, earlier, um, the life of a protein in the cell uh, uh, doesn't necessarily lead to the folded, what we call the native process. In fact, the life of a protein in the cell is full of dangers and it's monitored at every stage of uh, uh, its existence in the cell. So proteins are translated, are made by machines, very large machines called ribosomes. And this machinery called proteostasis, which one of the major components is the so-called molecular chaperones, uh, binds to nascent polypeptides as they come out of the ribosome. And they chaperone them very much like human chaperones all the way until they have their proper fate. And they prevent inappropriate interactions, that hence the name molecular chaperones. And when they detect the molecular interaction it, 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 that is inappropriate, they try to intervene, either by helping folding or by selecting the offending protein for degradation. And there are two major degradation pathways in the cell called the ubiquitin proteasome pathway and autophagy. They work in very different mechanisms. Uh, just have to remember that they, they both are ways to degrade proteins. Proteins that need to be degraded are selected by chaperones, by tagged by a little flag that says this protein is troubled called a polyubiquitin tail. And if proteins cannot fold and cannot be degraded, they eventually accumulate in some sort of inclusion or aggregate. And there is a lot of debate whether this is a protective or a toxic phenotype. Now, to do all of these different tasks, there are many of these molecular chaperones. And this is just a schematic to highlight that these different chaperones, which have different names, look very different. This is based on structures of these chaperones. Each one of these interacts with a lot of little other co-chaperone helpers, and all together they decide what has to be the fate of a protein in the cell. Well, they are very different. They recognize different elements in proteins, and they do different things to the proteins when they bind them. Molecular chaperones have one thing in common that they know and we don't, which is they know how to distinguish a protein in the cell that is not correctly folded and they can recognize it and select it for effect. So what you have to remember from this is that there are many different types of chaperones and this network called protein homeostasis or homeostasis is very complex. Now, this network is not monolithic and actually the health and functionality of the proteome depends on this very delicate balance between the load of misfolded proteins and the ability of chaperones to deal effectively with them. So there are many insults, stresses such as fever or uh, uh, oxidative stress or mutations as in the kind, the type that uh, occurs to cause Huntington disease that put this network out of balance. And actually, you will see that I also put aging here. There is a lot of evidence from many labs, including my own, that during aging, the machinery that maintains protein homeostasis starts to be defective. And this actually is a reason why many neurodegenerative diseases have an age of onset phenotype. Of course, cells have a way to rebalance this, which is to have stress responses that enhance the levels of chaperones and quality control systems. And this works through a variety of methods that we are trying to understand. So the main take home conclusion from this is that there is a balance and there are different ways to maintain protein homeostasis in the cell. And when this balance fails, then disease results. So how do these uh, uh, lessons apply to Huntington's disease? So I'm going to give you a brief summary primarily centered on work from my lab, but there are many other labs that have contributed to this that have examined Huntington proteostasis. 
So first, let me tell you one important aspect of this, that uh, in the aggregates of Huntington patients in brains and also in other cells, the exon one, which is where the expanded polycule resides, uh, is often found as a small N-terminal fragment. And exon one comprises the polycule segment itself, as well as an N-terminal and C-terminal domain that, as I will show you later, really are very important to understand toxicity. Now, there is a lot of data that this exon one fragment is a naturally occurring fragment that happens selectively when the polycule segment is expanded and it's relevant to disease. Now, we know that longer polycules <clears throat> are uh, pathogenic, and there is a lot of data showing that the polycule length correlates with disease severity and with age of onset. Interestingly, the longer the polycule tract, the higher the aggregation propensity of the exon one fragment, directly linking something within exon one that enhances aggregation propensity, could be aggregates or could be structures that are sequestered or have the propensity to form aggregates with disease. Now, this doesn't mean that the polycule length is fully determinant. As I told you, there is a proteostasis machinery that monitors, and shown here schematically, the state of proteins. And the proteostasis machinery can take a mutant protein and either degrade it or maintain it functional. However, when proteostasis is impaired, like in old age or during disease, this ability is lost. So I think, actually, that the disease onset and the severity and the cell type specific toxic effects of polycule expanded hunting team are deeply tied into the protein homeostasis machinery. And one of the, uh, I think, uh, circumstantial evidence that support this is that some cell types are more affected by hunting team than others. Another very interesting graph that I adapted here from a review from Huda Zogby is that for a given polycule length, the age of onset can vary by over 20 years, suggesting that something in the genetic background and perhaps circumstance of individuals can affect when uh, aggregates or toxic species or disease of onset start to manifest. And I would like to propose, and this is one of the things that our research would aim to, that by manipulating these cellular circumstances, we can actually ameliorate or delay the symptoms of Huntington. So there are two questions that we are trying to understand using exon one as a model. We also use neuronal systems, but exon one is really a fantastic model to study toxicity. How is the proteostasis of mutant Huntington managed? And we are also trying to understand why mutant Huntington uh, is toxic to cells. And actually, Natalia will have a lot more to say about one very severe aspect that we think contributes to toxicity. And actually, we believe in evolution. And uh, there is a lot of conservation in proteostasis systems, in all the systems that make cells function, because they are so ancient and important. So we use a variety of different models of increasing complexity to understand this question. Simpler models offer clearer questions, and then we look at how these questions and conclusions from simpler models apply to the more complex models of mammalian neurons. So I'm going to summarize decades of research by telling you that there are selective types of molecular chaperones that recognize selective elements in Huntington exon one. So I told you a Huntington exon one, as a polycule tract, and the polycule tract, even despite its low complexity, is recognized by some chaperones. My lab has done a lot of work on a ribosome associated chaperone called NAC for nascent chain associated complex that we show binds to the polycule tract in Huntington both during and after translation 
There are also chaperones that bind to an N-terminal flanking domain of Huntington called N17, including this very large chaperone intrigue, as well as HSP70. And there seem to also be chaperones that bind to a C-terminal flanking domain called the proline bridge domain. In addition, there are other types of chaperones that include the so-called small Hitchcock proteins uh, that bind we don't really quite understand how to Huntington, but seem to actually be important in the formation of inclusion bodies as well as in one of the particular types of degradation of Huntington. So in the lab, we have been very interested in understanding these different types of chaperones, the one that bind to Huntington, we think in the soluble phase or start to bind to Huntington very early in its life in the cell, and those that seem to be important for sequestration of Huntington into larger inclusions or structures. Uh, we are beginning to try to understand these processes as Huntington enters the cell during translation. Here you see Huntington nascent chains interacting with NAC. We think they interact also with other chaperones during the balance of folding and misfolding, as well as targeting them to degradation and aggregation. So there are a number of ways in which chaperones interface with Huntington, as well as uh, uh, both during early phases or targeting both uh, different types of intermediates to the different degradation pathways, as well as regulating aggregation. I'm not going to go into the experimental details. I just want to summarize briefly some work we have done with one of these chaperones, this ring-shaped chaperone intrigue. This was actually our entry into understanding Huntington proteostasis. And over the decades, we have found that a uh, uh, trick actually prevents formation of amyloidogenic species, binds primarily to soluble species, and prevents this N-terminal domain of promoting aggregation. There is also data from other labs showing that tree can actually protect uh, 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 neurons from Huntington toxicity. In work with Wachu, when he was in Texas, he now moved in Stanford. We also did structural analysis of how uh, TRIC suppresses Huntington fibril formation. We found that it can interact with the tip of fibrils and prevent them from growing. And of course, it also interacts with soluble species. And it's this little donut that seems to bind Huntington in the middle. Now, what's the story with aggregates? It is important when we try to understand Huntington proteostasis and its relationship to toxicity to address the question whether aggregates are toxic or are protective. And I think you have heard previously in this series this really pioneering work from Steve Finkbeiner, which in a, uh, a really landmark paper with Montserrat Arasate showed by following longitudinal in neurons expressing Huntington, that some neurons form inclusions, other neurons don't form inclusions, and the ones that don't form inclusions are the ones that die first. So this really supported the idea that aggregates or these inclusions somehow are protective. And our own work using yeast as a model system uh, reached similar conclusions that inclusions uh, stimulated by small Hitchcock proteins are protective of cellular fitness, perhaps by removing these misfolded species from solution. Now, when we think about inclusion, uh, 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 cells that don't have inclusions, we think of the protein being soluble. But actually, in a collaboration with W. Morner, who actually got the Nobel Prize for his studies of development of super-resolution microscopy, and this work was cited in his Nobel uh, citation, we learned that what seems to be a soluble or diffuse Huntington species, when you really look at it using super resolution microscopy, is not really soluble, but it's composed of really tiny, small fibrillar species. And actually, by following the time course of formation of inclusions in neuronal models, what we found is that the inclusion seems to form first and kind of sequester or prevent the formation throughout the cell of this really tiny soluble species. And it seems to be that somehow this system is saturated. And then you start to see this delayed emergence of these tiny 
mutant hunting team fibrils once the inclusion body appears pathway seems to be saturated. Interestingly, uh, in a collaboration with uh, Leslie Thompson, where we tried to harness chaperone-derived fragments to suppress toxicity, and, and this was work from M. Sontag, who now has her own lab in uh, uh, Marquette University, uh, we uh, all three together with W. Mariner showed that when we add this chaperone that suppresses Huntington toxicity to this neuronal system, the main target of suppression of the chaperone was the formation of this tiny little small diffuse species. So one conclusion of this is that molecular chaperones interact with Huntington at different stages and they seem to either promote solubilization or degradation of this uh, mutant misfolded hunting team or sequester them into inclusions. And when these two systems become out of sync, something happens and you start to accumulate some forms that are toxic and deleterious for the cell. So now I want to tell you a little bit about how we can harness this uh, uh, system to deliver uh, 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 new therapies. And actually, I'm going to tell you a couple of uh, experiments that come from my lab that suggest possible avenues to achieve this. So first, let me define the problem, at least how we think about it. So the way we think about the problem, as I mentioned, is that cells, healthy cells, have demand, meaning they generate both newly made polypeptides that need to be folded. They also have damaged polypeptides, but the cellular capacity can deal with the problem. When mutant hunting team <clears throat> emerges and it emerges at birth in affected individuals, the system can manage the load for many years. And for reasons we don't quite understand, could be aging, could be stress, could be that their system has an inherent ability to maintain this cycle working. Now the capacity actually cannot keep up with the demand for chaperones and proteostasis starts to be overwhelmed. Now proteostasis, this machinery that I mentioned to you is important to fold every single protein in the cell, in the nucleus, in the cytosol, in organelle. So once misfolding becomes increased, you start to generate more damage and more misfolded proteins, and then you see a collapse. And actually, <clears throat> many labs, including our own, start, have studied how the presence of these toxic hunting king species overwhelm both the protein folding machinery, the ability to clear proteins. So that's when you start to overwhelm and start to see toxic aggregates. And actually current work from my lab, <clears throat> from Ranen Abiner and Juliana Abramovich and Tina Lee are showing that this mutant hunting team starts to act and, and impair the process of translation very early on. So even the ability to make good, well-folded protein starts to be impaired. So one of the things we are very interested in is try to intervene at the system very early on, because if we could prevent the system from getting out of balance, maybe we could prevent all of the downstream problems. So the questions we're trying to understand is what are the factors that influence mutant hunting team structure and aggregation in the cell, so the interplay with proteostasis. We are also trying to understand what are the toxic species themselves, if it's not the aggregates, what is the effect of the polyglutamine expansion on the hunting team protein itself that is causing the trouble? Because if you understand this, we could pharmacologically intervene at the level of the structure of mutant hunting team. And of course, the big, uh, I think, uh, motivator of our studies is that we want to act really early in the process. So try to block or disassemble or sequester toxic soluble species before they can happen. So one of the uh, thrusts of our work in the lab is to try to understand if the toxic species are not lar large aggregates, what are they? Now, there is a problem in studying this in hunting team. The problem is that any biophysical, biochemical technique you use to study an aggregation prone protein necessitates the proteins to be in large enough amounts that they aggregate. So you end up studying 
aggregate, when what we want to study is the early stages from monomer to aggregate. We have done a lot of progress on this. One of the things we have discovered is that the flanking domains, flanking the PolyQ are really important to influence Huntington toxicity. We uh, work from Koning Shen, a really fantastic grad student in the lab that will soon be on the job market uh, uh, after her postdoc in Berkeley, showed that deleting different of these flanking regions changes the morphology of the aggregates, but also changes the shape and landscape of oligomers. Now, highlighting the importance of these flanking regions in toxicity, there is work from several labs, including Leslie Thompson, sorry, and uh, uh, William Youngs, showing that PTM, spot translational modifications in N17, particularly phosphorylation, can render an expanded uh, PolyQ containing Huntington completely non-toxic. This really suggests that if we would understand the conformation of the Huntington monomers and oligomers with and without the PolyQ expansion, we could perhaps find a way to make them non-toxic. We have used two uh, very sophisticated biophysical techniques to look at this. We, in a, a previous collaboration with the lab of Lucio Friedman in, in the Weizmann Institute and the National Magnet Lab in Florida, we did NMR studies looking at Huntington monomers, and we see that the monomer exon one can populate different conformations. And right now, Pierre Rodriguez, a really extraordinary postdoc in the lab, is using single molecule optical tweezers to look at the conformation of different variants of Huntington exon one with short cues, with long cues, with phosphorylation mimics or without, and look at the conformation of the monomer. And his data so far shows that the polyglutamine expansion affects the structure of the monomer, meaning super early on. And we think that understanding these structures could really lead to development of small molecules that actually prevent these structures from forming. In addition, we want to understand how chaperones recognize these structures, and we are going to do this using an MR and optical tweezers, because while we don't know what these structures look like, apparently chaperones do, and they can prevent the toxic forms from, from happening. So we can learn from chaperones to get ideas how to intervene. Now, another therapeutic intervention we learned from studying the proteostasis of Huntington in different cell types. And this came from work from William Fong that uh, uh, had the observation that, well, neuronal stem cells are really very resistant to prototoxic stress. Well, when you take these neuronal stem cells and differentiate them to neurons, so the progeny, they are very sensitive to proteotoxic stress. And this actually kind of makes sense because neuronal stem cells have to last a lifetime, lifetime so they really need to be ready to maintain excellent proteostasis. So what Williana did is uh, uh, examine the toxicity of Huntington in neuronal stem cells or in their differentiated progeny. I'm showing you here the result, her results for neurons, but she saw the same effects on astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And when she looks at Huntington in neuronal stem cells, actually Huntington is extremely soluble. There are no small fibrillar aggregates and it's very uh, robustly tolerated. When she differentiates these cells into neurons, she starts to now see aggregates and actually these differentiated cells are very toxic. So here we are looking at the toxicity, the level of cell death in both neuronal stem cells and their differentiated progeny with and without Huntington, you can see the neurons are very sensitive, a lot of death, and the stem cells are actually quite resistant. And Liliana did a beautiful study trying to understand this phenomenon, which is already published for several years, so I'm just going to summarize it. What she found is that neuronal stem cells have very high levels of trick and NAG and the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So these chaperones and proteostasis components that maintain Huntington soluble and degrade it very readily. And during differentiation, there is a change in the logic of the proteostasis machinery to now induce the small Hitchcock proteins and autophagy pathways that 
deal with Huntington by sequestering it and taking it for degradation. So this is, uh, I'm almost done with my talk. I think I just want to uh, summarize to say our uh, work on Huntington shows that there are many different strategies to ameliorate uh, proteostasis and reduce the toxicity of Huntington, either by acting during translation or on the early misfolding intermediates or by acting on these soluble uh, systems that keep Huntington from ever forming the toxic species or get them degraded or by promoting sequestration in inclusion. So enhancing the capacity of the inclusion to prevent accumulation of toxic species in the cell. So that's the end of my side of the presentation. I just want to acknowledge all the former trainees that have worked in this really an amazing team of people past and present that are working on different aspects of hunting team proteostasis and the conformational studies. I also want to acknowledge my amazing collaborators. This is a very old picture, but Leslie, Bill, Shembiao, David, and Wa are really a joy to work with, as well as our uh, uh, biophysical collaborators, W. Merner and Lucio, and some of the experiments I didn't have to tell you, time to tell you in brain slices were done together with Don Lo and Barbara Tony. So that's it. If anybody has questions they can't ask, please email me and I'll get back to you. Okay, that's that. Well, hi everyone. Uh, let me just um, prepare my screen here. I think it's all good. Yeah, it looks fine. I want to thank uh, HDF first for uh, granting me with my postdoctoral fellowship. And it's an honor to be here today to discuss uh, my research. I've been working uh, in the lab of uh, Judith Friedman at Stanford University. And I'm excited to share uh, with you how we are approaching uh, studying cellular energy dysfunction in Huntington's disease. So picture this as the Huntington gene, uh, and we have this gene expressed everywhere in our body. But when this gene mutates, it uh, makes a toxic proteins that form into clumps and it profoundly affects our cells and it disrupts cellular normal operations. It alters how genes are expressed, inter interferes with uh, the cell self mechanism, uh, uh, cleaning mechanisms known as autophagy and disrupt the cellular balance or proteostase as Judith already explained to you and also impairs the cells energy factories uh, our mitochondria, and I will talk about this in a minute. Um, but first, here is a puzzling fact. Even though the mutated protein is found in many cells throughout our body, uh, for some reasons, uh, we are still trying to figure out uh, the brain cells are the cells that suffer the most. So for some reason, the brain cells are particularly vulnerable in this disease. So let's zoom in in the brain. So considering here a well-functioning neuron, um, a cell type in the brain, it functions functioning smoothly, supporting our cognitive abilities. But when Huntington's disease strikes, we get abnormal protein clumps called Huntington aggregates uh, that just pile up. And those proteins are toxic, are toxic clumps, and they somehow interfere with neuronal normal function. And this interference is especially problematic uh, to the brain. And the result, we have neuronal loss and degeneration. But why the brain is so vulnerable? So the brain is our body most energy demanding organ. So neur neurons in particular require a tons amounts of, of energy uh, more than most of other cells in our body. And we need to produce, uh, those cells need to produce those energies, uh, the energy for the brain. So how the cells produce the energy that the brain needs. So in, in our brain cells, we have two main ways to produce energy. Uh, so the first one um, called glycolysis, you can think it like, like a way um, like a small battery uh, that gives us just a little energy. It's not very efficient, efficient uh, because it gives us like just two units of energy that we call ATP, which is the 
currency of the cell. Uh, you can think it as dollars that our cells use um, to do things that we normally do, like walk and think. And the second way to produce energy uh, called oxidative phosphorylation is way more efficient. Uh, it's like a big battery and it gives us a lot of more energy. And this major power supply happens in a special place within our cells, the mitochondria. And this is why we often call mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell. And what does it really mean? So within our cells, this tiny, this, this tiny structure, um, the mitochondria, it, have, um, it has two membranes, the outer membrane that is, is smooth and the inner membrane, it is like it's like these stripes you see here. Uh, it has this folded design, and inside those folds, inside the inner membrane, there's a lot of things going on. Um, there is a process called respiratory chain that is a series of biochemical steps uh, that you can think as a assembly line in a factory. And it's crucial for us, for, for our, our, our cells to produce energy. So <clears throat> besides being very complex, there are only four main things that you should know about the process. The number one is the fuel. So just like cars that need gas, uh, this respiratory chain, it requires fuel to run. So our cells use food we eat and the oxygen we breathe as the fuel. And second, the product. So the main goal is to produce ATP. So those energy dollars that we just talked about. And it use ATP just to do, well, everything, right? Uh, and the third thing, the, the, the third uh, important thing is the working mechanism. So this is like, just as any battery, you need a voltage to give power. So the mitochondria needs a membrane potential to produce ATP. Like, and then it's like maintaining the right condition for work at the best performance. So mitochondria utilize a flow of energy to build up a voltage across the membrane. And this voltage difference across the membrane is what we refer membrane potential and is crucial, essential for mitochondrial function. And last thing, um, if something goes wrong, this process can produce harmful substance that we call ROS. Um, and you can think ROS as like a pollution in the cells that um, it, it's harmful emission that can damage DNA, membranes, proteins, and uh, other important parts of the cells. So this, this, uh, the, the production of ROS leads to what we call oxygen damage or oxidative stress. And if it happens too much, um, mitochondria start misbehaving, contributing to aging and also disease such as um, HD. So there is a lot of many great work showing strike evidence for um, that individuals with HD, the mitochondria is not working at full capacity. And it suggests uh, mechanisms by which the mutated Huntington uh, cause neuronal dysfunction by disrupting energy metabolism, promoting oxidative damage, also altering mitochondrial membrane potential, impairing the mitochondrial respiratory chain activity. So the mitochondrial dysfunction is profoundly affected uh, in, in the brain and just having uh, mitochondrial dysfunction uh, affected, especially in the brain can be like crucial for this type of cell uh, and, and, and the brain because the brain requires a lot of energy. So having mitochondrial dysfunction is crucial for the brain um, viability. So also I want uh, another, another data showing mitochondrial dysfunction um, that's visually um, nice to, to study. Uh, I wanna highlight here this uh, super resolution uh, microscopy. It's a uh, data from our group showing a mammalian cell expressing uh, mutated Huntington. So you see in green, uh, the aggregates caused by the mutated protein and in red, 
um, here nearby is the mitochondria. So you see there is a close proximity suggesting a direct interference. And indeed, there is a lot of evidence showing that the mutated Huntington associates with the mitochondria outer membrane. And this leads to, again, impairment of the respiratory chain, depleting ATP, and increasing ROS. Um, also, this recent work from our lab with the collaborators Leslie Thompson and Wachiu using uh, cryoelectron microscopy uh, tomography, sorry, um, which is a advanced imaging tool showing evidence is indicating that the HD mouse model neurons exhibit altered morphology. And with this technique, you can see uh, details in the ultrastructure of mitochondrial membranes. And this one also, this bright signal interconnected our mitochondria in the cell. And you see that if you have mutated Huntington, this uh, we see a uh, fragmentation of the mitochondria. And this is a certain sign uh, that things are not uh, as they should be. So you can imagine that this is very hard and uh, complicated to study. Uh, and there are still many questions open that needs to be answered regarding the role of mitochondria dysfunction in Huntington's disease and how it influences uh, the disease progression. So in my work, I'm digging deeper into it. Uh, I'm looking at how this mitochondria might be part of a bigger picture um, in Huntington disease, uh, or how does mutated Huntington affect mitochondrial function. And because it can be very hard to study, I'm taking a more single cell approach uh, to study Huntington's disease. Uh, so I am using yeast cells, um, as a model for Huntington's disease, uh, because not only they are uh, like simple organisms, so the yeast cells are those that you have in your kitchen that you make bread, and they are actually very, very sophisticated cells. Although they are simple microorganisms, they have like a highly conserved biology and it shares a lot of biological uh, similarities with our cells. And it's very easy to manipulate genetically. We can introduce and delete genes very fast. Um, but besides all this awesome power of yeast, um, it has not been so great to study Huntington in the past, uh, because although Huntington uh, forms aggregates in yeast, we can express Huntington in the cell and it forms the aggregates. Uh, for some time, it was thought that it was not toxic in yeast. Uh, but I want to tell you uh, that East it still provides an ideal model uh, to study mitochondrial function in Huntington. And uh, I'm gonna explore you why. Uh, so uh, although like modeling uh, Huntington disease in neurons could be ideal, there's one thing that, th that makes um, the neurons not the best model to study the mitochondrial disease in Huntington's disease, because it presents some special challenge, especially when we want to, uh, to, to explore the mitochondrial function. Because when the disease affects the neurons, the mitochondria is so severely affected that it becomes quite impossible to study uh, mitochondria itself, because the, or the organelle is already under such a stress that becomes really hard to capture the initial triggers, triggers that we aim to understand, the initiating conditions which makes the mitochondrial dysfunction in the disease. But yeast is special in this sense because we can control the two ways that the cells generate the energy, either by glycolysis, we can just um, change the media that those cells are growing and it can uh, give them uh, glucose and then it will uh, generate energy by glycolysis and glycolysis, gly glycolysis do not require mitochondria, mitochondria. And if we give them glycerol, 
uh, they switch to oxidative phosphorylation, and here mitochondria is essential. So basically, you can force mitochondria to only live using mitochondria. You can you can uh, force the yeast to only live uh, using mitochondria, and we can control it by defining which media the cells uh, will grow, and we can dictate whether yeast uh, cells primarily will use or not mitochondria for energy production. So now I can turn mitochondria on and off in the cell, and I can study mitochondrial defects in yeast cells as well. And I'll, I'm going to show you how we can study uh, how we can study mitochondria in yeast. So uh, we can employ um, mitochondrial functional sensors, which are which are like fluorescence proteins that will be imported uh, in the mitochondria only if the mitochondria is healthy, because the process to import uh, proteins inside this, the, the organelle needs membrane potential or the cell membrane voltage. So if the mitochondria is healthy and the membrane potential is working uh, normally, uh, the fluorescent protein can be uh, inserted, can be imported in the mitochondria, and mitochondria will become fluorescent. But if not, so the import won't happen and we won't see any fluorescence. So here during glycolysis, here you see uh, yeast cells, normal yeast cells, and uh, expressing normal Huntington and yeast cells expressing the mutated Huntington. And you see that it forms the aggregates. Uh, and when we test using the sensors, uh, we can see uh, mitochondria in both uh, cells, normal and mutated, when uh, cells are under glycolysis. And if we switch, uh, to oxidative phosphorylation, our, our, our data here is showing that actually uh, we see disruption in the mitochondrial membrane potential, as we can barely see any fluorescence remaining in the mitochondria uh, of mutated uh, Huntington cells. You see the aggregates, uh, and we cannot visualize mitochondria anymore. So with the system now, I can uh, recapitulate uh, the mitotoxicity in yeast models of Huntington as we see for uh, neuronals. Um, okay, so next question is, are they toxic? Like, are they, the aggregates that uh, are formed in yeast, are they toxic? Because for a long time, they were thought to don't be toxic because normally we grow cells in conditions where uh, it doesn't need the, the mitochondria, right? So we normally feed the cells uh, with glucose and it goes through glycolysis and because it doesn't need the mitochondria, cells expressing mutated Huntington can grow as well as cells expressing normal Huntington. And this is like a growth curve that just follows the, the, the growth of the cells. Uh, the dashed dots are the mutant, and you see that the growth are very similar uh, between mutated and normal cells. Uh, but when uh, you grow in glycerol, uh, the mitochondria is actually required for the growth, uh, and you see uh, impaired growth in those cells. So here you see that the cells are not growing um, as close uh, as close rate um, as the normal cells. So now we show that actually uh, these aggregates are toxic for yeast cells as well. But only if you force them to use mitochondria. So the takeaway is that mutated Huntington is actually toxic to yeast cells if you force them uh, to use mitochondria. And mitochondria is dysfunctional in yeast cells expressing mutated Huntington. And now, my system unblock new possibilities to my research. Uh, to study uh, mitochondrial dysfunction in Huntington disease, I can turn on and off, and then I can follow the um, initiating triggers of this uh, dysfunction. Um, and then I can use the EAST model to explore mitochondrial dysfunction using technologies that are easy to apply in EAST cells and harder to do in neurons, such as 
visualizing ultra structure uh, anomalies um, and observe it in details using the technology uh, of Im uh, imaging technologies like cryoIT. Uh, we can also uh, apply some genetic screens for impactful genes, and we can um, understand which genes can alleviate or exacerbate the mitochondrial phenotypes associated with Huntington. And by understanding mitochondrial dysfunction mechanisms in Huntington's, we hope that we can develop target thera therapeutics that can be strategies to alleviate uh, the effect. So I'd like to thank uh, my lab, uh, Judith Friedman, my supervisor, my collaborators, um, and HDF for funding my research. Thank you. Thank you both so much for sharing your work with us today. Um, it's super interesting. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have time for live questions. So in the interest of time, we're going to move to an email-based Q&A. I will send the questions from the Q&A box to our speakers so that they can follow up by email. Or if you had questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, feel free to either email our speakers or email me. You can email me at sarahhernandez at hdfoundation.org and I will pass those along to our speakers. Um, we have one more webinar before the end of the year, so stay tuned for details about that. We are also hosting an in-person symposium and gala in New York City on October 30th. This will be in-person only, so we're not going to have a virtual component. So if you'd like to attend, you can go to our website and find more information. There's a link for that in the chat box now, so you can check that out and go to our website. It's going to be a fantastic evening that will benefit Breakthrough Science supported by the HDF. It will have talks from Dr. Jeff Kelly from Scripps Research Institute and Dr. Vanessa Wheeler from Mass General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. I would love to see you all there. So I want to end by, again, thanking our sponsors, Neurocrine Biosciences and Unicure, as well as everyone who donates to the HDF, our audience, and last but certainly not least, our speakers. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank you so much, Natalia, for sharing your work. Okay, feel free to email me with questions. Thank you, Judith. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye.